especially for stuff that's already been due, you know. All right. Um, today we're going to discuss JavaScript and, and talk about what it's used for and start uh, exploring that technology. Um, we don't really have uh, enough time to make you experts in JavaScript. But at least we can, we can uh, interest you in it and maybe point you in the right direction for further study um, of JavaScript. Let's start off by, by, first of all, let's show an example of JavaScript in action. More than likely, there is JavaScript in this page to accomplish the menus. And we'll take a look at the menus uh, in a second. It is possible some of this could be done via CSS, but more than likely this is done via JavaScript. Remember, we do have It is possible some of there, there are similar effects that you can get in, in CSS. For example, if you notice someone posted on the bulletin board in, in the weekend, they had some functionality on their page, and I had guessed it was JavaScript, and they corrected me and said, no, they were doing it with CSS. And so some of the effects you can do in CSS, for example, a link mouse over, you could change the background color, and that's something that could be done in JavaScript or could be done in CSS. I'm guessing this is done via JavaScript. And again, what I'm, what I'm speaking about specifically is this. Notice as you put your mouse over the different menu options, different main navigation options, the uh, sub-navigation options change. So my mouse is over news, my options are US news, world news, politics, today, entertainment, celebrities, games, movies, sports, scores, NFL, and so on down the line. All right. Now, let's take a closer look at what's going on here. And, and, let's, and, and take, by taking a closer look at what's going on here, um, we can get a sense of exactly what, uh, what the role of JavaScript is. And we're going to do that by looking at revisiting uh, my, my absolutely favorite diagram that I draw a hundred times at least in, in every one of my classes. All right. The diagram is this one. And it's where we have a client, which is me sitting at my computer browsing the internet. I have my web browser, which is a piece of software that allows me to view web pages and request web pages. I make requests that somehow make it through the internet and end up at the web server in question. All right? In this case, MSN's web server. Now, we talked a little bit about last time about forms and um, server-side scripting and, and that sort of thing. And we talked about how there could actually be programs on the server or scripts on the server that take data from a database and, and other places and sort of on the fly dynamically create a web page to get sent back to the uh, get sent by, back to the client. So there's scripting or programming that can happen on the server side. And, and that scripting or programming is done to create a new page, but to create a new page that is dynamic, that is that is reactive to what the user puts in, or maybe reactive to where the user is located. Uh, we did the Google search. If you searched for Italian restaurants, you'd get Italian restaurants uh, in this area would, would be weighted higher on the search list than, than other ones. But at any rate, there's scripting that exists, that exists on the server side to create a web page. 
There's also exists, uh, exists scripting on the client side because what is actually sent back to the browser is a combination of HTML and CSS, our old friends, plus JavaScript. And what's the role of JavaScript? The role of JavaScript is largely, not exclusively, you know, but largely to make small changes to the page without having to go back to the server. All right? So, with that in mind, let's go back and, and view this page again with, with that process in mind. So, I go and I make my request for a web page. I'm at my client and I type in www.msn.com. I hit enter. It gets sent through the internet. It makes it to MSN server. MSN server does who knows what. There's probably server side scripting involved. A lot of things. It may be accessing a database. The bottom line is it does its thing and comes up with a web page for me and sends it back through the internet to me. Now I'm viewing that page in my web browser. All right. And notice that a couple things happen. As I put my mouse over here, that changes. These photos are cycling through. All right. So in other words, the page is changing. But notice that the page isn't completely reloading. All right. In other words, if I put my mouse over money, immediately pops up business news, investing, quotes. If I put my mouse over sports, immediately pops up all that stuff. In other words, in terms of our document, uh, or in, ter yeah, in terms of our uh, diagram here, as I move my mouse over, it sure doesn't look like it is sending another request through the internet for a new page, right? That page doesn't flicker, you know. Notice even when I hit refresh, to refresh the same page. There's a slight lag and you can see some of the stuff flicker for a second. Yet when I put my mouse over these elements, I don't notice any of that. It simply changes. That's because there's code on the client side. It was sent to us by the server and there's code sent to us on the client side to do these little small manipulations to the page to make it more interactive or however you want to put it. All right. In a way, it's a win-win situation for both parties. It's like when you go to a restaurant, the, a lot of times, you know, the, the wait staff will come and they'll bring a little um, carrier and they'll pop it down and it'll have ketchup, mustard, salt, pepper, sugar, artificial sweetener, coffee creamer, whatever. Or you go, oh, see, someone, someone mentioned, uh, it was you, right, Richard, that you, you always leave my class hungrier because I always use food examples. I, I don't know why. But uh, you go to IHOP, right? Ooh, they bring you the big thing with jellies and syrup and all kinds of great stuff. And anyhow, let's think about that. What are they doing? They deliver that to you. How does that benefit the waiter? The fact that he leaves, um, he leaves at your table a bin of syrup and jelly or salt and pepper or ketchup or whatever. How does that benefit the server? He only has to make one trip. He only has to make the one trip. He delivers that to you. Then he's, you're not going to bug him every little time that you decide you want a little more syrup on your pancakes, right? What a pain that would be, right? What a pain for the waiter if every time, you know, you, you take a bite of French toast, you look, oh, wow, well, I, uh, gee, I really sh wish I had more syrup. Waiter, and the waiter would come over, dump a little syrup on, and all that, right? It would be annoying for the waiter, because the waiter would have to do a lot of work that you can do just as well as he can do, right? I mean, who is the, the most expert person about putting syrup on my pancakes? I am, of course. I can do that as well as anyone can. There's no particular need for the waiter to do that. That's not a skilled position, all right? That's not like uh, 
making uh, one of them flaming desserts at, at, at your uh, uh, at your table side. Well, that takes some expertise, right? Anyone can put syrup or ketchup or whatever. So it's a benefit to the waiter because the waiter then doesn't have to be bothered with all these little tasks. And the waiter can then concentrate on only the tasks that the waiter can perform. You know, you wouldn't want customers going back into the kitchen and grabbing their own plates and bringing them back to their table. That's something you want the waiter to do, right? There's a lot of good reasons why you'd only want the waiter to do that. But it also benefits you, the diner, right? Because you don't have to wait for the waiter to come over and put syrup on your pancakes. You decide you want more syrups on your pancakes, boom, it's there, and you can continue eating. So it's a win-win situation. The server, oddly enough, waiter or server, isn't bothered with these little tasks. You, the customer or client, uh, get an immediate response. And that's the same idea here. If we look at this web page, as I put my mouse here and the menu changes, I, the client, get an immediate response because that code has already been loaded. It was brought over once when the original page was downloaded and every time I want to change that menu, I don't have to go back through the internet and ask the server and get a response back. So it's a win for the client for that reason. Um, it's a win for the server because the server then isn't bothered with all these little requests and the server can handle the requests that the server needs to handle. All right? I mean, that would be quite a strain on the server if every time the mouse was put over here, another request was made. That would, that would really increase uh, the load on the server. And then the server would be bogged down doing little things like this where it wouldn't be able to do, you know, it, it, its ability to do the stuff that it needs to do would become compromised. Yes? Uh, kind of a stupid question, but, and you could be getting to this, but uh, the optimal situation would be if, if Java could do the server side script, to all, you know, and you didn't have to go to the server at all. Okay. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a good point. We don't have that option. Well, uh, our, the question was made, if this is the case, then why not do everything on the client side? Yeah, why not have everything, every piece of functionality on the client side? And I, and I do want to want to make a couple of points. First of all, when you, you asked the question, you said Java. This is actually JavaScript. That's okay. not Java. Right. And it's important to distinguish that because they really are two different things. All right. So this is JavaScript. Now the question is: Is why doesn't the client do everything then? If it's such a great situation. Any thoughts on that? You need the data in that database. You don't have that data on every copy of everybody's computer. Exactly, yeah. It would take a long time to load everything. I mean, you work on the client side. Okay. Two real good reasons were cited. Number one is if the client was going to do everything, you'd have to send a lot of stuff to the client, and that might increase load time. The other thing is that the client doesn't have access to the data over here. All right. There's some resources that are scarce and that are secure and that require um, sort of heavy lifting to, to handle. You know, to, to extend the restaurant analogy, um, the, the waiter will bring you uh, a, a bottle of ketchup and put it on your plate or put it on your table, but the waiter won't bring a bucket of caviar over and, dump, and put it on your table. Why? Because that's a valuable resource, all right? And there's security associated with that. You know, the waiter in, in, in the, the, the kitchen in general wants control over that resource, all right? Likewise, the waiter isn't going to bring you the, uh, I, don't even, I, I forget the name of it, but, but like the, 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 the stuff for a flambe that, that you're going to, you know, and say, well, okay, here's the, here's the brandy, here's the lighter, here's your cherry's jubilee, you know, go and, and fire it up yourself, right? Because there's safety issues there, there's security issues there, right? So the point is, to extend this to the uh, um, web server scenario, first of all, there's things that the server does that the client either can't do, would be impractical to do, 
or from a security perspective would not be a good idea to do. You know, for example, validating passwords. You know, if I sent the code to validate the passwords, then that code could easily be subverted, right? Um, so that's by necessity something that would have to happen on the server. Likewise, a client, remember a client can be like just about anything. A client could be my Nintendo DS machine. Uh, a client could be my phone. A client could be my browser on a Windows machine. A client could be my browser on a Linux machine. Therefore, there's no real assumptions made about what software is available on the client. And therefore, the client is limited. Now, the other issue that you have with JavaScript is that it can be turned off. You can go to your menus, or you can go through your options uh, on any web browser and turn off JavaScript if you, um, you know, there are people that, that don't want JavaScript running on their computer for any number of reasons. So the bottom line is, um, there is some work that the server has to do, all right? But there are some small things that can be sort of handed off to the client, and the client can take care of those. And again, if we look at this, this is certainly something that seems like a good thing for the client to be able to handle. Now here's an important um, implication of this. When that page loads, when that page is sent from the server to the client, all these menus are there already. All those menus exist in the client. All right? It is part of the HTML. And all we're doing is making them visible or invisible. As we put our mouse, we're making one of them visible and the rest of them invisible. So if we were to look through this code, and again, there, there's a couple ways this could be done. So, you know, I'm saying this with a high level of certainty, but not an absolute certainty. As you put your mouse over here, if we did a search, we'd be able to find all those menus. It'd probably be divs for each one of those menus there. It's just that those are set via CSS not to be visible. All right. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give the formula, um, so to speak, of how most client-side JavaScript works. Again, most. Don't never want to say all, right? But this is how most client-side JavaScript works. All right? There's three pieces to the puzzle. First one is HTML events. One of the key things about JavaScript is that it, it allows interactivity to exist on the page. What do I mean by interactivity? The user takes some action and the web page responds in some manner. That's what I mean by interactivity. All right. In this example here, the user action is put your mouse over one of the links. So that's what I mean by an HTML event. All right? We can write code that says, when a certain event happens, do something. So the first piece of the puzzle are HTML events. All right? Second piece of the puzzle is what's called the DOM. And DOM is an abbreviation for document object model. Let's consider this page again. As I mentioned, the way this is likely being done is there's a div for each one of these submenus. And as I put my mouse over something, all of them get hidden, except the one becomes visible. All right. Sort of implied in that is there needs to be a way that my code can point to something on the page and say, I want to do this 
to this element of the page. When I put my mouse over the sports link, I want to make the sports submenu visible. When I put my mouse over the entertainment link, I want the entertainment submenu to be visible. So with JavaScript, there has to be a way for me to say, this is the thing on the page I want to do something to. This and only this do I want to do something to. All right. So I don't want to make all the menus visible. I just want to make that one appropriate menu visible as I put my mouse over the particular menu item. I want to make the, the specific submenu visible. So I need a way to point to the page. Or more specifically, to point to specific things on the page and say, hey, do something to this. Now, what am I going to do to that? I'm going to change its properties. All right. What's a property? Well, in HTML, the properties are the attributes or properties of the tag. So, for example, if I have a link, or if I have a picture, an image tag, there's two properties or two attributes to that tag. The source attribute and the alt attribute. So I can change any one of those. So I can change a picture. All right. How do I do that? I point to that particular thing on the page and I change its attribute. All right. Actually, these are two HTML attributes. There are also style attributes. Right? I can define style attributes for an image, for example. That's just one. I, I just put a border attribute, but there, there's tons of different attributes. All right, that exist. I can go and I can change those dynamically. And I do that by first pointing to the thing I want to change and then specifying what property I want to change and what value uh, of the property I want. Uh, what was the new value I want for the property? The ability to do that, the ability to point to something on the page and to reference its properties to change it or to access it is what the DOM is about, the document object model. That's our hook that allows our JavaScript to talk to our HTML and to manipulate our HTML. So that's the DOM. The last piece of the puzzle is the actual JavaScript language itself. And you know how you do things in JavaScript. What is the syntax for the commands? HTML is a pretty forgiving language. For example, if you forget a closing tag, it's not going to validate, right? But your page will still display. It's possible it might look a little goofy on a different browser, but nothing really tragic is going to happen. In JavaScript, if you don't follow the syntax of the language, um, it's not quite so forgiving. So we'll look at some of the issues uh, concerning that. All right. These three things work together to do that interactivity. All right. Let's look at these three things for this example. Let's talk about them. The event, the HTML event, is when the user puts their mouse on one of these links. 
So that's the event. The DOM is the language by which we point to this submenu and say what about it we want to change. For example, if I put my mouse over sports, entertainment becomes invisible and sports becomes visible. So I need to point to that entertainment div and say make you invisible. I need to point to the sports div and make it visible. All right. So I need to do sort of both things. I need to first point to the thing on the page and then I need to change the particular properties, access and change the particular properties I'm interested in. Finally, there's the JavaScript language itself, which actually what sort of brings everything together and actually carries out the mission. All right, let's go over uh, an example that we write of our own. And let's copy this gallery example and let's add some JavaScript to it. Right now I have a page that shows all four images. Picture one, picture two, picture three, picture four. All right. Let's go and change this. And I'm going to go into the gallery HTML and I'm going to get rid of the style sheet. Actually, no, I'm not going to get rid of the style sheet. Yeah, I am going to get rid of the style sheet. I'm going to write my own CSS code in here. And I'm going to get rid of this navigation. And I'm only going to display one image. Actually, I'm not going to get rid of this. I, I'm having a great debate with myself today about a lot of things. I'm only going to show one image. All right. That's the first image, which is a beetle of some sort. All right. So let's see what we got here when I save it. All right. There's the beetle. Now what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to want to do. And this could be done a bunch of different ways. I'm going to put a series of buttons on here. If you remember back when we were talking about forms, we talked about one of the form controls is a, just a plain old button. It's a button button. It's not a submit button. It's not a clear button. And we said the purpose of it is to trigger some JavaScript. So we'll start by doing that. I'll put Input type equals button, um, value equals show picture one. All right, show picture two, three, and four. So now we have a 
Show picture one, show picture two, show picture three, show picture four. All right? But nothing happens when we click them. All right? First thing I'm going to do, and I'll do this with button two first, and then we'll go back and we'll do all of them, is I'm going to associate an event with that button. All right? What are events? It's, again, it's the actions typically that the user takes. There are other events that, that don't necessarily relate to a user action. All right, there's like timed events and on load and, and all that. But normally when you're talking about interactivity, you're talking about the user doing something and a page responds. Therefore, these typically talk about or, or handle things that the user does. So, one of the events that I can write code for is the on click event. All of these events start with the word on. Alright, so if you see on click, on mouse over, on um, key up, on key down, on load, all of the events start with the word on. Alright, and we can do a quick Google to look at We can look at an example of what some of these are. On load, on unload, on blur, on change, on focus, on reset, on submit, on abort. For now, we're going to be interested in the on click event. Because that's the action the user is going to take. When do we want something to happen on this web page? We want something to happen when the user clicks on these buttons. So, on click. When the user clicks, I want to do something. All right. So that's, the, that's our user event that's here. We have the on click event. We're not done with it yet. Oops. We're not done with it yet, but we know it's going to be an on click event. Now, the next thing we have to do, get into, is we have to get into the DOM. All right. What I want to do is, as I click these respective buttons, I want that picture to change. It's picture one now. When I click on this button, I want it to change to picture two. I want it to change to picture three. I want it to change to picture four. So, in order to do that, I have to somehow be able to point to this image. Because that's the image that I want to change, right? It right now is image one. I want to change it to be image two. Then I want to change it to be image three. Then I want to change it to image four. Now, we've already seen a way this semester to point to one specific thing on a page. How do we point to one specific thing on a page? For an ID, right? An ID needs to be unique, that is, there's only one thing on the page that, uh, for a given ID. And so we can use an ID to point to something specific on the page to define CSS. Well, we can do the same thing here for our JavaScript. So, I'm going to go in and I'm going to give an ID of this to, of, rather, um, Image pick, IMG pick. So now this has an ID so I can point to it. All right. Well, how do I point something to it? Well, I use what are called DOM expressions. Remember, the DOM is the model, the document object model is the mechanism by which we point to something on the page. Now, a very popular Example of a DOM expression is this one get element by ID. Oh, 
So that should be a lowercase i. That's a DOM expression, all right? Document means it's somewhere on the web page, somewhere on this web page. Get element by ID says, all right, find the thing on the page that has this ID. And the ID that we're interested in is this one right here, image pick. So what that does is that point to this HTML tag, if we put that in there. Now, what do we want to change about this HTML tag? Which attribute do we want to change? Yeah, uh, let, for now let's just worry about changing the source. We'll, we'll talk about changing the alt later on. But yeah, we would want to change the source and the alt. For now, let's just focus on changing the, the, the source. All right? And then, but yeah, good point. We would want to change the alt as well. All right. So, in order to do that, I'm going to write this expression, and then we will analyze it. On click equals document dot get element by ID image pick dot src equals the name of image two. So in other words, when they click on this button, show picture two, I want to change this image, which currently is showing 1.jpg, I want to change it to show 2.jpg. Therefore, my instruction says, document, get element by ID, image pick, dot src equals 2.jpg. Document says what I want to change is somewhere on this web page. All right, what I want to change is somewhere on this web page. Get element by ID says find a thing on the page that has that ID, and that ID being image pick. What about that do we want to change? Oops. We want to change the SRC attribute of it. The SRC attribute being the attribute of an image that controls what image is being shown. Finally then, equals, and then we have the value that we want to set it to. Let's go and check this out, make sure it works. So, we load the page, image one shows up, we click on that button, image two shows up. All right? And it happened without going back to the server or anything like that. It all happened via client-side code. Now, what do you suppose the rest of these are going to look like? They're going to look just about exactly the same. So I can just cut and paste those to their respective buttons. And now we can go in, and as we do that, as I click around, we get each of the pictures in turn. Again, the recipe. HTML event sort of gets the ball rolling. That says we want to do something. The DOM, the document object model, says 
How can I point to the thing on the page that I want to change? I first point to the element that I want to change, then I point to the specific attribute of that element I want to change. All right? Because I can't simply say I want to change the image, because as was noted, the image has several properties. It has the SRC, it has the alt, it could have other properties as well. I have to say which one I want to change. And then finally, the JavaScript syntax itself that says what is the code to do that. Now, one thing I want to look at here is notice the use of quotes in this. The double quote goes around the entire JavaScript statement. This is the entire JavaScript statement. So the double quotes go around that. Inside of the double quotes, wherever I need quotes, I use single quotes. All right. So for image pick, I use single quotes. For one.jpg, I use single quotes. Why do I need single quotes for those? Those are what are called literals. In other words, they're not values that are going to change. I want that exact value to be used. So therefore, I use quotes around them. Now, JavaScript is not, or uh, JavaScript is not very forgiving. It is, for example, case sensitive. So, if I were to say document get element by ID image pick, and I have the Im word image capitalized, I just broke that one. Now it doesn't work. The other ones work. but that one doesn't. Likewise, if I get the name of the function wrong, if I use get the DOM expression wrong, and have it capitalized where it shouldn't be, same thing. Nothing happens. Now, how do you debug this? All right, because you know there's a good chance you're not going to get it right the absolute first time. All right, how do you debug this? This is one case where I find debugging in Firefox a lot more straightforward than debugging in Internet Explorer. Within Firefox, if you go to Tools, there is an error console that you can go to, and that will show all the errors that you've ever encountered. And if we look. We see the errors that we were just getting here. Document get element by ID, image pick is null. Well, again, this is sort of like the error messages a validator gives you. It's not necessarily obvious, but what that's saying, in effect, is document get em, Im, element by ID, image pick doesn't exist. And again, if you remember the fact that Java is case sensitive, you can see, okay, I got the name of it wrong. All right. Likewise, it says document get element by ID is not a function. Well, I sure thought it was. Well, it is, but it's spelled with a lowercase d in ID. So you can actually clear this to start with a blank slate because this will show you every error that Firefox got. All right. So if you've been browsing the web for uh, for a day, you'll get all these errors that have nothing to do with your code, right? That came from those sites, but Again, as you go and get your own errors, you can see them, and, and that, is, that is somewhat useful. The top errors, as you can imagine, um, first of all, you know, forgetting that it's case sensitive and not getting the name exactly right. All right? Um, that's, that, that is a very common error, not remembering it's case sensitive. Now, now that we can do this, you had mentioned about changing the alt. Changing the alt, you would simply, after the semicolon, put another instruction. So you would say something like document get element by ID source equals that alt equals picture of beetle. Then since that's the first picture, 
that displays, I'll make the alt here too. And what's picture two, picture of bull? So we could do that separated by semicolons. And if we were viewing the all that would it would show it. All right. Now, now that we do this, we can have all kinds of fun. We can hide the pictures if we want. All right. Let's write code to show and hide the images. I'm going to start with a hide and I'm going to do it with a button. Button input type equals button. Value equals hide image. On click equals Still want to point to the same image. What property do I want to change? Well, I want to set the visibility property of this. All right. The visibility property is a CSS property. And I can go for a CSS property, style.visibility visibility equals hidden. Notice this is different than that because this is a style attribute. The visibility exists in CSS, whereas the SRC is an HTML attribute. And by the same token, I'll do the show image. So I can make it hidden if I click the first button. I can make it visible if I click the second button. I can hide the image. I can show it. Now, in essence, this is the root of how to do that mouse over menu functionality, right? We don't have buttons that we're clicking on. We have links that we're putting our mouse over. But we could fairly easily adapt our code to, to do that. The point that I want you to get today is an understanding of the purpose of this. Why we're even doing this in the first place. You know, to allow for small cosmetic changes to the page without reloading the entire page. How we're doing it? HTML event gets the ball rolling. The DOM allows us to point to specific things on the page and specific attributes of those things. And then finally, the JavaScript language is the language that allows us to go and set or change those values. Any questions about this? All right, I will uh, zip and send this up and uh, we'll see you up in lab.